The following video is caused by me trying to look up something, not finding it easily, and suspecting that maybe you couldn't either. This is about the global positioning system we have in place and changes in it over time, and recent ones that have made it cheaper and easier to get high accuracy data at a particular cost. The Earth's diameter in miles, I'm not going to use metric, you can go look it up, is anywhere from 7,917.5 miles to 7,907 miles, almost exactly. That's off by 10.5 miles, so if you just memorize one of them, 7,907, and then include 10.5 miles, you have a pretty good rounded off number that works well, because this is based on sea level diameter. The Earth isn't completely round. This is an averaging kind of thing, and I'll average it later. Now, that gives a depth uh, to the core of the Earth, <clears throat> or the center, not the core, of uh, 3,958 or 3,953 miles. A difference of 2, excuse me, 5.25 miles is actually going on here. Now, considering the tallest point on Earth, that means that you can have places that appear to be a really tall mountain that are actually lower than what would be considered sea levels in places. That and the fact that satellites orbiting the Earth aren't really perfectly orbiting and there is degradation to the orbit means this information that you get on your smartphone that you rely on <clears throat> is going to have an inherent accuracy problem unless you do certain things. Now let's discuss the circumference of the Earth broken down in arc seconds. An arc degree is 360 degrees, right? Okay, and 160 of that is a minute, so that's an arc minute, or one minute of arc. And then dividing it again by 60 gives us arc seconds, or one second of an arc. There are <clears throat> 1,296,000 arc seconds for a circle. Okay, now why is this important? Most people, unfortunately, keep putting in non-decimal degrees for GPS coordinates. So it's degrees, minutes, and seconds. How accurate is it? I'm just going to give you the average information based on the Earth's diameter and or circumference variations, the numbers you can look up. 69.11277 miles per degree of arc. Okay, so every degree, it's not 70 miles, it's 69 miles almost exactly. It's 69 miles and 595 feet almost exactly. exactly. So you can actually write that on a sheet of paper pretty easily, and it'll be listed below in the description. For a minute of arc, or an arc minute, we end up with something so close to a mile that I would, I mean, you might want to look up what a statute mile is. Um, it works out to 6,082 feet minus one inch. It's so close to that number, I would round it up and not care that I'd be wrong at the poles. What about an arc second? This is the number where people stop writing stuff in old diagrams and charts because it's 101 feet and four inches almost exactly. That's pretty good, or fantastically good resolution, if you need to locate something that's within line of sight. If you're not aware of it, an arc minute, just degrees and minutes, would have been enough to see something within a mile. This gets it within 100 feet. That's, if you think about it, even for a few seconds, that's obscenely good resolution to write down basic data. Okay? Now... What's the highest permanent settlement on the Earth and the lowest? The lowest, we'll call it sea level because I'm not including Death Valley or whatever. It's 16,700 feet above sea level in Peru someplace. It's the highest permanent settlement. Others are very similar altitudes, so we're going to call that the maximum limit where you'd need to mark a location that would be permanent, unchanging, and you don't need to go check it a bunch of times. This means you could go to a specific spot, use it as your reference point for zero, and literally, like... There's a, a page I brought up at one time in another video where those markers you find, if you look around enough on the Earth, you find these little brass markers that are about that big around, or they can be bigger, and they include a, a geodesic or whatever it is point, and it's a chunk of brass. I want to build a bunch of them that are distinctly different by using uh, aluminum bronze, which is aluminum and copper mix, because they're also sometimes called hammer bronze, and do this as a public activity where people would go out very accurately get the GPS location for something and deliberately kind of move around until you get rid of as many decimal places of error as possible and compare it with 
lots of cell phones, lots of handheld GPSs, lots of uh, the Arduinos, whatever. Get it as close to perfect as possible and mark that location. But there's a specific method that has to be done that we're going to talk about at the end here. GPS devices have to have a clear view of the sky, an unobstructed line of sight to the sky to see at least four GPS satellites to receive their signals and then calculate based on diversity from all four or more sources. And then they have to correct for atmospheric interference, drift in each satellite's position off of what it's supposed to be, and their internal clock. And also, again, using diversity, more satellites is better because they can't all be the same error unless that error is what you correct for. And then finally, lookup tables that you would use either A, through having them downloaded and stored, which would eliminate a lot of radio interference, or B, just use a satellite signal from them and then just use uh, cell phone signals. Just use the bands that make it to where your cell phone doesn't send out a lot of data. Have it collect the data and then do the sample. This would work and is accurate depending on where, what you're looking up every 24 hours. Certain satellites will be marked as not updated as far as being able to correct that by doing something simple. Someone at a fixed location that doesn't change position gets the data and sees how much the drift is and corrects for it, which means you've already figured it out. You use one or more, preferably more, completely different GPS receivers and compare what they say to what you're really standing on and then put in the correction value and then just start walking away and go do it. You can do this at preferably three points. The area you want to work in, do all four points on a map and then do one in the middle and if you can get it corrected to the point that it's plus or minus nothing, you might have forced it to be artificially accurate. Let's continue. What's the highest accuracy that would be considered important. If you're old enough, you remember when GPS was restricted by the U.S. government because, obviously, if you can't figure this out, you could make a remote-controlled or an autonomous aircraft into a big flying bomb expediently and turn it loose and have the GPS pilot it. Because all it has to do is get above anything it might run into, fly, be made out of literally balsa wood, and, you know, you get the idea, a bomb plane. Um, so the U.S. government decided to include a noise signal before the year 2000. They would have the high accuracy, one or two foot accuracy, plus or minus one foot of accuracy, while moving at 1,000 miles an hour and at 60,000 feet, because, because that's what you need for an airplane, to make sure they can't hit each other, because there was an accident, a mid-air collision, and the GPS was scrambled enough that it might have caused it, so... The U.S. government, immediately after that happened, started denoising the signal. The U.S. government control, regulation, license, approval, export law for military-grade navigation tech systems, ITAR, is still in place. But it's only about you making one in the United States and sending it out of the United States for sale to foreign nations. Meanwhile, every foreign nation said, those are your laws, and just because you technically control GPS doesn't mean we can't put up our own satellites, <clears throat> which every country then did because they just needed high accuracy. Even they, even some countries like China would scramble the signal with it, but let's move on. Consumer or course acquisition code L1C slash A GPSs, 1999, you'd get anywhere from 300 foot wrong all the way down to 20. It was a crapshoot, unless you let the thing sit still. Again, this was about things in motion. ITAR only covers whether or not it's moving. If it's moving at a speed that's more than a car can drive, like 50 miles an hour, let's say, then it would be at the speed where you have stall speed for quote-unquote conventional airplanes. They didn't think anyone was going to turn loose a glider from a mountaintop and, you know, pull a 9-11. Now, after that, <clears throat> after they started doing that, which was May of 2000, they stopped doing the scramble. By 2014, you could get one foot, one foot precision for plane altimeters, even for a Cessna. But the GPS XYZ thing would only go down to what? Well, 100 feet was standard. But that's because it's an airplane moving. We're trying to map the planet like make sure our house is in the proper level or we have our, our property line properly mapped out and we don't want to spend a lot of money on it. So new GPS satellites by 2014 were regulated 
not by the Department of Defense or the ATF that would declare it under ITAR, International Trafficking of Arms and Regulations or whatever. It was under Export Administration Regulations, or EAR, through the Department of Commerce, DOC, USA DOC EAR. These are ITAR-free satellites, which means they don't even have the ability to get things wrong because it just adds another level of complexity. By 2015, you could easily, on a smartphone, yes, 2015 smartphones, seven-year-old smartphones, good God, you could get 16-foot accuracy, or five meters. Three-meter accuracy, or 10-foot accuracy, on a dedicated consumer GPS receiver <clears throat> that anybody could buy. They might be expensive or whatever, but the reason is they would update that little map thing you were looking at to where it would contain the correction data for each satellite, because there's a limited number of them. By 2019, uh, you could get a SparkFun RTK and GPS, or RTK slash GPS, for under $200 that would give you one inch accuracy. And some of these were made for flying drones that could go 100 miles an hour. They were already exceeding the limit where the thing shouldn't be able to do the resolution. But was it really that resolution? By 2023, this is the end of the year, so I get to say that one more time, you'd have 100 centimeter or three foot uh, correction quality through DGPS ground references and also using cell phones and cell antennas that would mark their location by telling you their static GPS because it's not GPS, it's their latitude, longitude, and degrees, minutes, and seconds, and then hundredths, which means it's down to one foot. These are geometrically measured. Geometry means measure of Earth, geometer. 10 meter quality or 30 foot accuracy from handheld barometric, barometric altimeters was the standard for just a consumer grade height calculator when you're going hiking in the mountains. 10 meter 30 foot accuracy was also available if you had six satellites on uh, RTK GPSs you could buy for, I'm not kidding, they're like 10 bucks. High let go RTK GPSs if you had six satellites viewing. Now, here's how you get the ultra-high resolution. Leaving it setting for up to an hour if you're in a bad location, or in a good location, 10 to 15 minutes, which is the standard, you get half-inch accuracy if you got 16 satellites. Diversity of data sources correcting for each other by happenstance without having to have lookup tables and without having to go ahead and do some sort of uh, reference point downtown in your city or looking for one of those little big, you know, one of those big uh, brass nubbins sitting on the ground telling you exactly where it is. So how do they position them? Some of them are positioned exactly at a certain number of degrees, minutes, and seconds, so it's an absolute dead bang accurate point. Some of them include little trailing edges because it's a point of interest or it's the only hunk of rock in the area that's actually tied to the earth itself. It's part of the substrata, so they'll bolt one there too. If it's a big boulder, it can still shift one good flood or, or a bad rainstorm or mudslide, it'll be wrong by many, many meters. Now the math works out that you have these averages I'm going to repeat. If you're doing degrees, you're accurate plus or minus almost 70 miles. It's 69 miles and 595 feet per degree. Per minute, the next two digits, you get it down to 6,082 feet minus one inch of accuracy. And again, this is the way people navigated by ship for a long time. That's pretty damn good. A 60th of a degree is something you can do, at least if the ship isn't moving too much. And down to 101 feet and 4 inches if you could get the next two numbers. So you'd have degrees, minutes, and seconds, which is still pretty damn good. And that's the way it was since we were able to do that all the way till the year 2000 when the government turned off the noisemaker and got it down to, I mean, it's pretty damn good if it's 30 feet, but it was usually around 100 feet. And now you can get it down to the point that you can move the thing and it'll detect it. Just saying. And again, just let it sit there a long time. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Good luck.